Hello everybody and welcome to Tuesday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Now before we get into the news, as ever, tiny bit of housekeeping if you've not done already, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you're one of those trolls that just arrive at this channel just to dislike it in the first 10 seconds, then go ahead and dislike it, move on to your next victim. Shall we get into the news? Oh, before we do, a little bit of Pritch news, really. If you've not seen it, we did a live stream last night of the second stage of the Tour de Zwift. I ended up doing two of the group rides. I did the first ride around Richmond, which was pretty bloody brutal, as it always is around Richmond. If you want to check that out, you can do that up there. But then also, for some reason, someone who will remain nameless, Niels Heldens, said if I get more than 200 likes on the stream, then I have to do the following group ride, which was Innsbruck. Lo and behold, somehow, because as soon as you put a challenge to people, they, they accept it. I managed to get over 200 likes, which is great. Thanks for that. But also it meant I went and did Innsbruck. But it was a cracking, it was a cracking stream. I felt really, really good, which was slightly worrying. Because normally when I feel good and my legs feel good and I've got good sensations, it normally means I'm getting ill. So we'll we'll uh, we'll find out if that's and I didn't sleep last night either. I think I'm coming down with uh, a cold. Just a cold. All right. Anyway, if you want to do that, you can check that out up there. Go and leave a comment, go and watch the stream, watch all the entertaining bits, and uh, let's get on with some news. Now, first up, some real world cycling news, not racing, not esports, actual commuter news. Now, during the first lockdown here in the UK, you might have noticed that there was a lot of pop up bike lanes being made across the whole country to try and encourage people more to get on their bikes to commute and less people on public transport. I think the public transport actually stopped the first time around. I can't, I can't quite be sure, but we were trying to get more people on bikes so they weren't interacting with a lot of people and not spreading the, the virus around. And then once lockdown had started to ease, a lot of those bike lanes got dismantled because a lot of people, uh, I think in Manchester was a particular case, where people were complaining that this bike lane wasn't getting used anymore and they needed to open it up for cars. Now, down in London, the hotspot of commuter cyclists here in the UK, where lots of people ride their bikes, there was one bike lane in particular that has been in the news over the past couple of months, and that is the Kensington High Street bike lane. At a cost of £320,000 to install this bike lane, it allowed 4,000 commuters to use this bike lane in a safe manner to get to and from their destinations of work. However, the local council decided to rip up this bike lane after 322 people, bearing in mind there was up to 4,000 people uh, using this bike lane on their bicycles. 322 people complained that it was increasing congestion on that road on Kensington High Street, which was 0.2 of the population of the borough. I think something like that. But anyway, the council decided to rip it up to allow more cars to get through and their idea was to reduce congestion. Now, the absolute legend that is Adam Tranter decided to check this out and find out just how much it had eased congestion by using a traffic cam and Google artificial intelligence to work out just how much that bike lane was being used by cars. And guess what? Well, you probably read it in the news already because it's been all over the news. What we found out is by ripping up this bike lane, it actually increased drivers' <laughs> travel times. It went up by a couple of minutes westbound and I think up to three minutes eastbound. And what they found out was that this new car lane was being blocked between 50 and 80% of the time by cars who were just parked there sometimes on double yellow lines for up to 10 hours. So in effect, by ripping up this cycle lane, it allowed one person to just sit their car on the high street, park up and cause even more congestion, increasing commuting time if you were in a car. How stupid. However, the whole story behind this is the local council is set to review their decision to remove this bike lane and potentially, after spending 320,000 pounds putting it in, they potentially might be going back down the route of that bike lane and putting it back in. All thanks to the hard work and effort of Coventry's first ever cycle mayor, Adam Tranter, which is, which is unbelievable. It's crazy to think that car drivers still feel that they have a right over the roads because they pay their road tax. Now, if I lived in London, which I would never do, 
But if I did, for whatever reason, I would just commute everywhere on bike. I know it's dangerous. I know there's a lot of idiots out there. But it's so flat and so easy to access just about anywhere in London on a bike, it makes no sense to use a car in London. And it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that congestion increased by getting rid of that cycle lane and overall commuting times increased up to three minutes. It's insane. I don't understand why we can't just take a look at what's happening in Denmark, take a look at what's happening in the Netherlands and Belgium and just replicate it here and everybody in their cars just get off their high horse and accept that not all cyclists are knobheads, the majority of them stick to the rules and they just want to get to and from work safely without being killed on their bikes. Is that too much to ask for? It's not, is it? But anyway, leave your comments down below. Are you a user of that bike lane? Do you now use your car because of it? Are all car drivers knobheads? Ooh, controversial. Now we know, we, we know they're not, but there potentially might be one or two that are watching this now who's gonna get triggered by that. But anyway, leave your comments down below on that one. Do you think they should reinstate this bike lane? And do you think that council should be now looking to uh, create infrastructure within city centers across the UK, across the world, for a more pedestrian and bicycle. I mean, I don't even know why I'm asking that question. Of course they should. Of course they bloody should. Next up, and a little bit of niche news as we head to the track now, Gregory Bourget, nine times world champion, Olympic medalist, has decided to call it a day on his track career as he announces his retirement from the sport. What an illustrious career. I don't think, I might have raced him once. Never beat him, but I'm sure I've been on the track at least once when he's raced. So Bourget first competed at the Olympics in 2008 at Beijing. And it's a bit gutting that he's not able to see out his career at the Olympics. Had the Olympics taken place in 2020, he would have been able to do that and retire a lot happier than probably what he is now. It must be so frustrating. And I know Ed Clancy, for instance, he's in a similar boat. He's right on the edge of being ready to retire. He's got these young pups chomping at the bit ready to beat him in that team pursuit, to push him out of that team. And truth be told, I think as soon as the Olympics finish, we'll see Ed Clancy call it a day. I don't think he has the, the, the motivation to go on beyond this next Olympics. And it's unfortunate that Bourget isn't able just to, to, to see his career out at the Olympics. Whether he wins a medal or not, I think it would have been a fitting tribute to, to such an amazing rider who's been on the scene for so long, who's been at the top of his game for so long, now, I don't necessarily think the French will do very well at the Olympics. It's all about the Dutch. And you just never know with the, with the British riders. I wasn't expecting anything, if I'm honest, from them at Rio, but well, what do I know? They ended up winning gold. So you never know what's going to happen. However, with the French team, they've, they've always been there or thereabouts, and it's always been thanks to Bourget that, that, that they've been able to do that. So Gregory Bourget announced his retirement. Have you got anything to say on that? Have you got a favourite, I guess the favourite Bourget moment has to be when him and Kevin Siru went head to head in that match sprint and, um, well, this happened. See him go down, let's see what happens. Oh, yes. The if anything, that was Siru that initiated that move. Oh, how, how Borges pulls that oh. off, that is impressive. Unbelievable, Jeff. Anyway, leave your comments down below if you've got anything to say about track cycling in general and especially Gregory Bourget. Hesh! Next up in the news, let's talk about this story over on Cycling News. We're going to learn this one together because I don't know a great deal about this one, but it sounds interesting and it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on it. Lawsuit hits Trek Bicycle Company for false, deceptive helmet safety claims. Technology and testing both in question by New York Plantiff with Bontrager's Wave Cell brand. So this is a class action lawsuit that's been filed over in New York seeking $5 million against Trek Bicycle Corporation related to its Bontrager brand, stating that the company used false deceptive claims about the new wave cell helmets being highly effective at reducing brain injuries following a bicycle crash. One of the issues is with a claim by Trek that the wave cell is up to 48 times more effective than traditional foam helmets in the prevention of concussion from a bicycle crash. The suit said that Trek profited from false claims charging an inflated price that saw some models sell for as much as $299.99 at retail. Now, see, this wave cell technology sounds like it should. Listen, ain't no doctor, ain't no lawyer, ain't no scientist, but knowing what I know about helmets and the way they're designed and what happens during a crash, 
to your head and the helmet. See, I used to work for a company uh, that distributed RI motorcycle and car helmets. So we did a lot of training on helmets and one thing we learned was just how effective a RI crash helmet is. And that is because of the, the softness of the foam and the hardness of the shell. Now, obviously you can't have that with a, a, a cycle helmet because you don't want the cycle helmet to be too big. But really, cycling helmets are pretty much useless. It might be controversial, but they are. They will, in some cases, uh, reduce the impact upon the head on a crash or in a crash. But when you compare them to, to an RI motorcycle helmet, you'll realize how inferior they are and pretty much how useless they are. Like that foam, that EPS foam, won't take and won't do its job properly because it's just too stiff. Now what Arai did, instead of having, like you see on a, so on a bicycle helmet, right? What you've got is this, this plastic outer, which is soft as, right? That's doing nothing, right? And on the inside, you've got this hard EPS foam. Like it's really difficult to, to put your, to press a, an indentation in it or make an indentation. That's what I'm trying to say, I'm tired. But what Arai did was they produced a really, really strong outer shell on their motorcycle helmets. Now we're talking motorcycle helmets here, I know. Faster speeds, bigger impacts, more dangerous overall. But the concept of the helmet should be the same as the concept of the helmet here. And I guess the, the MIPS system tries to replicate that in some way. But what they did was they went for a, a really, really stiff outer shell to take that first impact and to allow that helmet to glide and slide. Like I said, it's a motorcycle helmet, so you're traveling at a faster speed, so what you want to try and do is deflect. If you're hitting, a, if you're hitting something direct, what you'd want to try and do is, is, is glance off it, essentially. So what they did was they created a really hard outer shell but the, 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 the EPS foam in the middle is soft, so your head's allowed to, to penetrate, not penetrate, but press into it and dissipate the energy a lot safer than trying to dissipate the energy in a rock hard inner EPS system. Now you can tell me I'm wrong if you want. I don't mind, I could be wrong, but this wave cell technology is trying to replicate a softer interior that allows your head to, to move into and to dissipate the energy through it and having that wave system will allow energy to disperse over a greater surface area, right? Maybe it doesn't do that as effectively as it should by the sound of it, the fact that there's a lawsuit on Trek's hands. Don't really know where this news story is going other than we're learning about the safety of bicycle helmets. Shall we leave it there? There's a lawsuit against Trek because they're claiming that this can reduce the risk of serious brain injuries by up to 48%, but in actual fact, probably doesn't. And if you want to reduce the risk of brain injuries, probably best off wearing like a motorcycle helmet on your bike, but you're not gonna wear you. So anyway, it's an interesting story. Thought you might like to know about it. Let's move on to the next one. Next up in the news, I just want to touch on this story as we saw Cameron Jeffers making his BBC TV debut. I don't like to be compared to, to Lance Armstrong. And I don't think it's fair to compare him to Lance Armstrong. Now, I'll be honest, I never knew anyone had compared Cameron Jeffers to, to Lance Armstrong. That is absurd. Cameron Jeffers is clearly way more of a sociopath, way more of a liar, a cheater, a scumbag. So if anything, they're doing a disservice to Lance. Unbelievable. I don't even think he cheated. He never tested positive. <sighs> But anyway, if you want to check that full story out, link is down in the description. It's quite an interesting little story. I can't help thinking that Zwift must watch that and just get so frustrated <laughs> watching someone screen record Zwift, clearly using it on a, an inferior uh, device that's not allowing it to run at the speed it needs to run, and it looks absolutely diabolical. But anyway, they haven't paid for that promotion, have they? So they just have to accept that the BBC can't understand how to record uh, a decent, maybe they should have spoke to me, a decent um, screen grab of Zwift. But anyway, link down in the description if you wanna check that news story out. It's only a couple of minutes long and it's really interesting and um, you get an insight into to Cameron Jeffers again, which is always nice. And then finally in the news, let's talk road racing. 
Remember that story we spoke about at the start of the end of last week? Mark Hershey deciding to leave Team DSM. No one knew where he went. For a couple of days he went AWOL. But the rumours were right. He is heading to UAE Team Emirates to line up alongside Tade Pogaccia for this year's... Well, hopefully he's going to be there at this year's Tour de France. But how is he going to get on? Because at Sunweb, pretty much did what he wanted. I mean, the way Sunweb rode that Tour de France was phenomenal in the end. Like, never really there or thereabouts in, in form of a GC contender, but they always had people up the road, and it was mainly Hershey that was up the road. But what's going to happen now? Is he going to be able to throttle back and become a, a player for Pogaccia, or is he just going to want that free reign to go and do what he wants? Or are they picking him for shorter stage races, classics races, where he can go off and do his own thing? Uh, I think UAE Team Emirates needed someone like Hershey, but how is it going to affect his career? Is he going to get the freedom to do what he wants in a long Grand Tour, or is he going to have to toe the line for Pogaccia, considering that Pogaccia really, well, he never really needed many teammates, did he, to win the Tour de France? But yeah, Hershey has gone there. Is it a good move for him? Clearly, it's going to be a good move for his bank account and the fact that he's got the 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 COVID vaccine, which I didn't realise. A lot of people complaining about UAE Team Emirates getting this vaccine when there's, and I never really thought about this, when there's key workers and hospital staff and various different people throughout the world who need this <laughs> vaccine a lot sooner than these healthy young men do. So what's your, what's, what's your thoughts on that one? Do you think that if they had the money and they could have paid for it, that they're entitled to it? And it's good for the sport that they've got it because now they're, you know, we know that they're not going to be giving out and spreading that disease and they're also not going to be getting it. So do they need to carry on the protocol that's going to be in place, getting tested on a daily basis at a stage race or prior to them racing? The likelihood of them having to miss races because of a positive test now becomes, well, hopefully if this vaccine works, zero. So... Is it a good thing? Should they have waited? Should they have allowed all the people to get it? Because don't forget that technically it's only 53 vaccines that they've had. I think it was 53 members. And would it have been better to give them to 53 old people that could have caught COVID? I don't know. The story, the main story is about Hershey going to Team Emirates, but the other story is people got pissed that they were all getting injected uh, with vaccines that should have probably gone to uh, other people. Leave your comments down below. Good move for Hershey. What do you think about the vaccine? D UAE getting the vaccine. I don't care whether you think it's real or not, or if it's a hoax or anything like that. Fuck. Anyway, final story. Challenge Mallorca has been cancelled. One of the first races that a lot of the pro riders like to take part in while they're over on the island during training camps is Challenge Mallorca. It's like a seven-day, one-day stage race, but the... There's no GC, they're all individual stages, but they're all back-to-back, -back. and I don't really understand it, but it's always a fun, good race for the riders. However, it's been cancelled because of corona, isn't it? What's your thoughts on that? I have none. Let me know down below. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you've not done already, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you're wondering why this video was so ad hoc and bizarre this morning, it's because I got two hours sleep last night. Great success. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, notification bell, dislike if you want. I'm off for some sleep. Hesh.